Hey everyone, welcome to the Coastal Podcast. I'm Pastor Lucas Granger and want to say thank you for listening in. May this podcast bring some light to your world today. Enjoy grace and peace. Amen. Good morning, Coastal. I'm all checked out. My wife this morning says, hold up your hands. I said, hold up my hands. She said, hold up your hands and make sure your belly's not showing. So if I, <laughs> if I do this, I think I'm covered. <laughs> oh, me. That's a good woman. <laughs> she did do that. Um, today, I don't get very many chances to, uh, to preach. So I told, uh, I'm going to give you two sermons today. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out which, which uh, scripture I wanted to preach on, and the Lord kept talking to me. So just be patient with me. I'm not going to uh, preach two long sermons. I'm going to preach two short sermons. Uh, the first part is going to be basically I want to look at the foundations of our faith. We're, we're talking about faith. I wore my faith shirt. So we're going to be centered around faith. The second part of the scripture that we're going to be reading, I'm, I'm going to try to touch on the faith and how to live that out. And we're going to look at how a father who brought his demon-possessed son, how he lived out that little bit of faith that he had. Um, so we're going to be in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19. Um, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of God is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come. I just ask, Lord, that now that you not only anoint my lips and let it be your words, I ask, Lord, that you open our hearts, uh, that you'll um, give us the Holy Spirit, Lord, to, um, to take in what you desire for us to leave here with. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I, re I really want to do is, and I think it's very important in our scripture this morning, as I want to set the, the, the scene where they're at. I want to set the scene of where Jesus and the disciples are at this point. They have left from Galilee, and they have went 25 miles north to this Caesarea Philippi territory that was um, ruled by the Romans. And uh, it was basically sitting at the, um, at the base of Mount Hermon. Uh, Mount Hermon was a huge mountain. It was over 9,000 feet tall. To give you a little uh, picture, uh, I think the largest or the tallest mountain that we have on the east coast uh, is Mount Mitchell, which is about 60, what, 66, 67? Anybody know that? So it's a big mountain. And uh, the importance of... of, of, of it's, it's interesting, I should say, that Jesus brought them to this territory. And uh, this was a very, I guess, uh, luscious, um, had a lot of plants. It, it had a, uh, a beautiful river, a beautiful uh, waterfall. And it is said that the springs that come up out of, the, out, out of this ground and stuff fed most of the Jordan River. So it was a very attractive place for worship. And, uh, but the problem is, is that the worship that went on at the base of this mountain, 
uh, at this cliff was actually pagan worshipers. Um, it was dominated, uh, the, the, the territory was dominated with immoral activities and pagan worship. Um, the Greeks actually uh, had this territory back in 332 B.C., and they ruled over it till about 30 B.C., until the Romans took it over. And they worshipped a god called Pan, P-A-N. Uh, it was uh, a god that was a uh, half goat, half human. Some of you may, may have seen a picture of him. And he was a, uh, a fertility god. Uh, so you can imagine the acts of worship that went on in, 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 this, in this territory. They were horrendous, to say the least. So it was a center of worship of the god of Pan. Uh, and at this point in our reading, like I said, the Romans had conquered it. Uh, Harold Philip had renamed the city Caesarea Philippi after Philip and, of course, uh, Caesar Augustus. So this is the setting. The question is, why would Jesus bring his disciples from Galilee, which is a religious community, Jewish community, why would he bring them 25 miles right here in the, in the midst of the pagan worshipers. What these pagan worshipers believe was this cave was at the base of this mountain or cavern w would fill up with water and it would spew, spew out. What they actually believe is that these gods that they worship would actually travel from the underworld or Hades or hell and to earth and back. That's the way they travel. So it, it got the name called the Gates of Hell. That's what they called this area, the Gates of Hell. And this is where Jesus brings the disciples to give them what, what I'm considering is a graduation speech. He's preparing the disciples for what they were getting ready to face after the cross. He was preparing the disciples uh, for what they needed to hang on to when, when, when they come against evil, when they come against uh, doubt, when they come against darkness, they needed something to hang on to. So Jesus takes them up there in the face of evil. Okay, You, you, you want to you defeat your enemy? You've got to get in the face of that enemy. Amen. And Jesus took them directly in front of the gates of hell. He knew that their faith would be tested. And if we live a life of faith, ours will be tested. So he brings them here. And, I, and, and this, is what, this is what I think, there's three things I think that Jesus established in his, what I call, graduation speech to the disciples, okay? You know what a graduation speech is, right? You get the smartest kid in the, in the school, and he gives us his speech to, to prepare the students to go out. That's what he's doing with the disciples, okay? But I want you to remember this, okay? He did say that his promises, what? He promised that all the power of hell right in front of the gates of hell. All the power of hell will not conquer it. Will not conquer it. So what was he saying? Will not conquer it. Let's look and see. He established this. He said that the church is built on faith. Their church will be built on faith in God. He said, I will build my church on this rock. Now, he wasn't talking about Peter. I know some people say, but Peter means rock. He wasn't saying the church was going to be built on Peter. Peter was human, just like us. Peter made mistakes. Peter denied Christ three times. He didn't say the church is going to be built on Peter. What did he say? He said the church is going to be built on faith that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's, that's what the church is built on. Matter of fact, this is the first time in the New Testament that the word church has been used. And Jesus used it then. We know, um, we know that the church, the first church, was actually established after Pentecost, 
right? That's what, that's what, we, that's what we learn. But Jesus knew that the church was going to have to be built on faith. The future church was going to have to be built on faith. The second thing that he established is that faith is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. He told Peter, he said, nobody revealed this to you. No human being revealed this to you. God revealed this to you. God revealed that, that, the faith in you. He initiated the faith in Peter, okay? He initiated that faith in Peter so that he could believe. It was revealed to Peter by God. Everyone here today, everyone here today, if you believe in Jesus, you have been given the faith to believe. Amen. That faith has, was initiated in you by God. It wasn't it's initiated any other way, just like salvation. We don't have to work for it. It's a gift. Faith is a gift from God. Also, the third and last thing I want to establish before we move on is that the object of this faith that we're talking about, the object of this faith is Jesus. Jesus is the object of our faith. It begins with Jesus. It ends in Jesus. Jesus is the author of our faith. He's the one that initiates it in us. He's the one that initiates the relationship that we have. And he is the perfecter of our faith. He's the one that's going to see it through. From the beginning to end, Jesus is a source of our faith. So this is what Jesus has done. He has brought his disciples to this pagan worshiping, uh, I don't know what you call it, a shrine of sorts. And he's laid it right in the face of the gates of hell that I'm going to build my church on faith. You're going to need to hang on to this faith. It's a gift. And I'm the source of that faith. That's what he's trying to establish. Now, in between where I'm getting ready to take you in Mark 9, 14 through 19. We're going to be in Mark 9, 14 through 19. In between the scripture in Matthew and the scripture in Mark, there's a couple of things that happen. And I ain't got time to preach on all that because Lucas would kill me. We need to, we got to go eat lunch. But in between this, it said six days later, Jesus took three of his disciples up this mountain. Now, most Christian um, the, uh, theologians and, and historians think that the mountain is Mount Hermon. They were still in that region. So six days later, he said he, he, he took three, James, John, and Peter, up this mountain. And he got, uh, James and John and Peter, got to see Jesus transformed into his glorious state. Okay? He was transformed. His, his, his clothes were whiter than any Clorox could, could make it. His, his, his face shone, uh, sort, of, sort of reminds you of Moses when he went up on, on, on the mountain, okay? And he came down and his face was still glowing. But anyway, I'm, I, I don't know the picture here, but I know Jesus was transformed into his glory state. Also, they got to witness uh, Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law, uh, Elijah representing the prophets. And he got to witness them having a conversation with Jesus. I can imagine that conversation had something to do. With, with maybe going to the cross, going forward. And what was going to happen? I don't know what the conversation was. But boy, what a faith builder. Can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing Jesus transformed into this glorious state? Can you imagine seeing Moses, who'd been dead for years, Elijah, and having a conversation? How much more evidence would you need to know? Okay? They was on top of that mountain. They was on top of that mountain. And we have those on top of the mountain moments too with our faith. Sometimes things are going perfect. Everything's going good for us. And you feel so close to the God. And there's other times that we have circumstances in our life, whatever it may be, and it just seems like it gets dark. And we get fear built up in us and our faith wavers. But right now, 
James, John, and Peter, they were on top of that mountain. That's what happened between what I just told you in the scripture in Matthew and what's getting ready to happen in Mark. So I want you to turn to Mark 9, and we're going, we're going to talk uh, about verses 14 through 19. When they returned, when they returned from what? When they returned from this mountain of transfiguration. When they returned to the other disciples who were waiting at the bottom, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and, saw, and some teachers and religious laws were arguing with them. And when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe. Maybe because he was still glowing. Maybe just because they were excited to see Jesus. And they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about? And Jesus asked one of the men in the crowd who, uh, the crowd who spoke up and said, Teacher, and this is the father I'm talking about. Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. In other words, he comes, he looks like he's dead. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? Man, that seems a little harsh. But these disciples have been with him for how long? You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? I'm sort of wondering what James and John and Peter sort of sitting on their sides thinking right now. But they just witnessed Jesus being transformed. Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground, withering and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. And he replied, since he was a little boy. In other words, it's been going on for a long time. This spirit often throws him into the fire or into water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Mm. Might have been the father's mistake right there. What do you mean, if I can? What do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. Anything is possible. And the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. So when Jesus saw the crowd of the onlookers and it was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. He said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion, and it left him. The, beer, the boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd uh, as, as people said, he's dead. And afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. Only by prayer. Four insights. I want, I want to bring four insights that we can learn from this Father's search. The first insight says, faith, faith sent this Father on a journey. Faith sent this guy on a journey. I'm going to read a quote to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that you probably ain't going to uh, tell what movie this came from. But it's from Frank Brennan. And Frank was um, sort of put a different spin on this movie. And the movie is Polar Express. It's a Christmas movie. We're almost the end of July, but we're going to have Christmas in July. 
But he put a different spin on it because he replaced Santa Claus with God. And he looked at this movie through that lens. And here's what he said. He said, when doubts arise, our faith invites us on a journey. Objective spiritual truths are not revealed as our senses easily deceive. Yet we hear a call. We hear a call to progress towards the truth. What I'm saying here is that faith, your search for faith, your search for more faith will send you on a journey. It's just that little bit of faith, that little bit of faith, is that's enough to move us forward to finding more faith. Because faith is a journey to look to, for Jesus. That's what faith is. Our search for faith sends us on that journey. It's a search for truth. It's a search for faith. It's a search for Jesus. See, our search for faith is um, it's an adventure, to be honest with you. Sometimes it's, it's not a good one. Sometimes it's hard. This father went searching when he had nowhere else to go. He didn't have all the answers for his son. So he went searching. My journey may not look like your journey. My, my prayers may not be your prayers. My needs probably is not your needs. But each need will always ask us, are we willing to follow Jesus? Are we willing to go searching? Are we willing to search for the truth? Are we willing to take that journey? Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find it. Knock, and it will be open to you. We must seek out Jesus. We must seek out Jesus. We must ask for more faith. We must seek out the one who freely gives it to us. And we must be willing to take that journey. The second insight. His father was desperate. He was desperate. For years, his son's been stricken by this evil spirit. And I can imagine, I can imagine the shame that others looked upon them. I can imagine uh, the strain that it put on his marriage. He was desperate. We must, we have to get to the point where our search for faith becomes a desperation. It must be a desperation in our hearts. We must recognize that need. The father wanted more. He said, I believe, but I want more. I need to know more. I'm desperate. Have you ever been desperate? Or are you discontent with your, where you're at in your relationship with Jesus? See, I don't think we never need to be content. I think we need to be desperate. Your need, my need, your need is the opportunity to know Jesus more. Your desperation can be that spark that, that'll send you on that journey. That journey for more. We got to be desperate for more. The third insight is this. The father was honest with Jesus. He was honest with him. 
He was an open book. He, he was far from denial of his weakness. I want to say that again. He was far from denial about the situation. See, we have a tendency sometimes to sort of hide our lack of faith. You know, we put on a smile, we come to church, we do all the right things. But deep down, deep down inside our hearts, sometimes there's a need. And we have to be honest. See, faith is built up on our willingness to come to Jesus with an honest heart. Faith is built up, it, it, it is built up on our willingness to come to Jesus with an honest heart. A repentant heart. See, faith is made stronger by us admitting our reliance upon him. So to move forward in our faith, we must realize our weaknesses. And we must be honest enough, honest enough to ask for more. Psalms 139, 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And point out anything in me that offends you. And lead me along the path of everlasting life. An open book. Are you willing to be an open book? My fourth insight. Faith requires us to have endurance. Faith in, requires us to have endurance. And what I mean by that is this. As I mentioned earlier, this, this, this uh, father's child had been sick since, since he was a child. Obviously, he wasn't a child no more. Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? Oh, ever since he was a child. So evidently, he's not a child no more. So this has been going on for years. And this father has endured the pain. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that God wants you to suffer in order to gain faith. But what I am saying is that through that suffer suffering, God is there. And your faith can grow from it. And I think this faith, this father through all that he went through and all that he endured, I think the miracle in his life at the end, is, it, it was worth it. I'm not saying that, again, I'm not saying that God put suffering on you in order to grow your faith, but, but he will grow your faith through that suffering. The hardest thing for me to do sometimes is to wait. Endurance is hard. I want the quick fix. I want the quick cheeseburger at the to-go window. I'm just like the rest of you. But there are issues in our lives that requires our faith to be stretched. And it's times such as this that we must hold on tight to that little bit of faith that we have and continue along that journey. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up for just a minute. Um, the very last part of our scripture, um, deals with the disciples' question. And the question is, why couldn't we hear the boy? I mean, we've had this, we've healed, we've healed in the past. Why couldn't we heal, heal this boy? And Jesus told him, <laughs> he said, this can only be cast out by prayer. So what does that mean? Well, here's what it means for me. This is what God revealed to me. 
He says, in other words, you, you have no power without me. You can't fight the gates of hell without me. He said, you must remember that I'm the source of that power. I'm the source. Without me, you're helpless. Did the disciples, did they forget that? Were they trying to heal this boy with their past experience, their own strength? So you can't fight the gates of hell without bringing him along. See, faith, okay, and prayer, they're intertwined. You need both to fight off the enemy. You have to remember Matthew 16, 18, he said, all the power in hell cannot conquer our faith in Jesus. This is our journey. It's been said that faith is a bridge of where I am right now and where God wants to take me. So my, my prayer for you is this, that you're hearing the call, that you're hearing that call to, to come along on a journey are you willing to take that journey and if so then I'm going to ask that you go search and I promise you this Jesus will meet you on that journey he'll cross over that bridge with you and he desires to take you on that journey. I don't know how many of you um, have been on that journey. Like I said, I don't know your journey. I don't, I don't know your needs. But our Father in Heaven knows them. Our Father in Heaven knows them. Let's cross over that bridge. Let's get closer to Christ he desires for us to be on that journey let us pray Father I thank you that you're willing to meet us on our journey I want to thank you for the gift of salvation I want to thank you for the gift of faith I want to thank you that you've been so patient and that you waited for me to meet you on that journey. I'm thankful, dear Father, that you have said that if we will that if we will move closer to you, you will move closer to us. I'm thankful, dear Father, that you initiated that faith within us so that we can believe. Here at Coastal, each and every Sunday, we want to give those who might not have never been on a journey, who have never met Jesus, or at least has never fell to their knees and, and, and asked Jesus to come into the life. So right now, I'd like to give any of you that opportunity it may be a hard journey but it's going to be a journey that you're going to be glad you made it was a miracle in my life when I gave my life to Christ 
So if any of you want to take that first step to that journey, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand up real high so that I can see it. If you have never asked Jesus Christ into your life, if you have never took a journey with him, today's the day. It can start today. Is there anybody? Okay. That's a good thing. Everybody knows Christ. Everybody knows Christ. My cha- your challenge is to know him more. To know him more. Well, we hope this podcast has blessed you. In case you didn't know, we are in the middle of renovating a brand new facility right here in Brunswick County, North Carolina. So listen, two things. Please take a moment and pray for us. Also, if you'd like to give to the ministry, sign on to the website at mycoastalchurch.com slash giving. Hey, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Grace and peace.